shine go. things inside yeah so oh, nice what we're gonna see is they have a room that's set up essentially for coral propagation uh -huh. and the whole system goes from let's say growing corals to be larger getting these corals out to acclimated into the natural ocean water and then putting them out in the ocean so the whole restoration project has a few different steps but it takes up a lot of space because you can uh, imagine yeah how many um if we have you know 300 corals in our stocks right now how much space does that take up so these big out of ground pools over here we can actually walk up to they're completely filled with corals wow right interesting yeah no the anue anue is the the fishery right there on sand island well what's like the lagoon there right the lagoon area yeah oh, okay. yeah keihi lagoon and yeah. everything so anue anue fisheries research center that's been the name of this site since you know back when the state wasn't even the division of aquatic resources oh, i think wow. it was the hawaii fishing game yep so back then this fisheries research center serviced more to facilitate let's say uh Hawaiian sustainability through aquaculture. Uh -huh. So we had a lot of projects and a lot of this facility was built for shrimp aquaculture, moi aquaculture, mullet mm. aquaculture, even mahi-mahi. So we are studying how can we potentially increase these stocks locally or train local businesses to bring these, uh, let's say different diverse aquatic agricultural opportunities to Hawaii. So if you want to start a shrimp farm, you would come here to get oh. your stocks and to learn about, hey, is my site able to hold this many shrimp? And uh, what are some things I need to know or need to learn about for my site specifically? Our experts would be the ones you consult. So oh, I see. Fish and game kind of service more as like, a, you know, here's how we're supporting our aquatic industries and aquaculture was a huge part of that. So that's why this is like the fisheries research center where a lot of what we do now here, it's fisheries related, but you're not going to see quite as many fish as you'd expect. Right, right. <laughs> I saw where how they have like these big corals and they'll take the corals and the graphite and you know the the coral has a memory of a big coral so when they are planted they, re they remember how big they were so they grow as like 10 times as fast is that so, true well what happens essentially is corals are um, a single organism that will settle down on a surface and right. then as that single organism that single polyps grows into what we think of as a large coral colony right. it's actually just duplicating itself uh, so it's cloning itself over and over and over again creating this big structure so that's what it's built to do it's designed to do so if we have this big structure and we take just a piece of it and put it down over here it's going to want to do the same thing that it was doing over here replicate 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 so now right. those two pieces could grow into each other and if they meet hey you're the same as me they fuse together and now we've got one huge coral oh interesting so that's the concept that the coral nursery kind of works on we fragment coral into tiny little pieces and all these tiny little pieces grow until they meet and connect. Where do you get other. the corals from? The corals are usually taken from sites that are, let's say construction sites, like the military's rebuilding a harbor. There's gonna be corals that may be damaged that have to be removed from the site. We'll go in and remove all those corals before they get damaged or um, let's say destroyed oh, right, by the construction. Right. Oh, wow. So other than that, some of our corals will take from, let's say areas that um, there's been boat groundings or um, just destruction on the reef, we can salvage some of that broken coral. Because oh. just like a person, when a coral breaks, that open area is like an open wound. So, you know, infectious diseases, bacteria can easily get into that. So the survivability of a broken piece of coral yeah. is very little. So if we can mm. grab it in the next few days, get into our facility, we can actually make that coral more useful than it would ever oh, be. Oh, that's in incredible. Environment. Yeah, it's that's pretty great. Cool. Oh, man, okay. So this area over here oh. is where we can see quarantine, quarantine on the tank. So this is where a lot of the corals come into our facility. So let's say they're out in the harbor. We grab them before they're destroyed as part of a construction project. We're going to put them in this quarantine tank so they can get rid of any of that bacteria, viruses, oh. things from the open ocean that could harm our system. 
Because huh. essentially corals are really fragile, so as you look around, you can see, you know, not too highly densely stocked or anything. And yeah. over here, you can see the care that goes into keeping corals clean. So right now, are you just scrubbing off some algae or diatoms? Yeah, this, this one has a, a parasitic nudibranch or... Okay, yeah. Festilla? Yeah. yeah. So Festilla is a type of nudibranch, it's a sea slug. And that sea slug specifically eats parietes coral, so this type of coral. Oh, I see. So what happens is through our system, sometimes the little baby sea slugs can actually just settle and turn into an adult in this tank. Wow. And so what's really interesting is, you know, that's really cool that they show up and everything, but they do eat the coral, so it can be pretty damaging to our samples. So we've got to make sure you inspect the coral, make sure you remove any of those uh, nudibranchs out of here. And once they're clean, they put it over here. Um, that I don't know, is this the clean side? Or well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm scrubbing them, making sure that there's none on them, and then I move them over, and then we'll do that a couple times just to make sure that they're clean. Right. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm only scrubbing the area here that's already dead. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's the part that's alive? So all the brown. So you see this white on the top? Yeah. Um, that brown that's growing right there is algae, but everything around that is live tissue. Oh, I see. So yeah, you can see, you know, there's that much live tissue um, throughout the whole coral. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, there's just a couple areas there that have died for unknown reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that could be water temperature or anything. Someone stepped on it. Yeah. Any yeah, reason. Yeah. It, it, any, anything that can irritate it, it can yeah. introduce bacteria or... Oh, you know, okay. Yeah. Wow. A really cool thing to notice too, um, especially is that as a coral, let's say, dies and starts to get algae that grows on it, the algae grows almost instantaneously as soon as the tissue's gone. So this brown color that you see here that's very different from the tissue color, yep. that'll start to grow within, let's say, hours of that coral being dead. So if we look into our tank here, you can see actually some of these pieces that have more um, let's say more algae growth on them. That's probably been dead for let's say a week or so and that algae slowly building and building and building. Yeah. So when you're out on the reef, you can tell, hey, is this a reef that's recently died by looking at the amount of algae growing on the coral? Oh, I see. And that's a yeah, big deal if you're talking is. about the health of your fishing sites or the right. health of the spots that you frequently go to. What's the thing that you're gonna look for that tells you something's changed here? Well, look at your coral. Your coral is supposed to look brown, healthy like this, and if it starts to get that algae growth on it, mm -hmm. you know that this coral is actually starting to suffer because coral should never have that algae growing on top of it. Wow. Yep. So over here, we've got some more uh, varieties of corals. Oh yeah, beautiful, species. look at that. Yeah. Yep. So these, oh, we've got it labeled here, recovering. recovering. So where are these recovering from? <laughs> yeah, this is like uh, K Bay, you know, if you go down in the middle of K Bay where, you know, the sand island is. Absolutely. You see a lot of coral like that down there. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's a little more Evermonti. There's a little bit of everything in here, oh, honestly. Yeah, so, who knows? Because <laughs> it looks like modules, too, yeah? I, I, I think these are the ones that have just been um, moved out of quarantine. Oh, okay. And so there is yeah, the this next kind of next you know, just a <laughs> holding pattern, yes. holding pattern before they go inside. So these are all clean too. They so these to are clean. all cleaned already too. Oh, okay. These are out of quarantine, and this is kind of a holding tank. So oh, these okay. are either going to be used to fragment into smaller pieces to make some of our modules, or we're going to grow these out and potentially outplant them. But the variety oh, in here, yeah. great observation. Kaneohe Bay, yeah. underestimated as one of the best reefs out here. Yeah. So many people don't realize how beautiful the reefs are in Kaneohe Bay. Yeah. The diversity of coral and the amount of fish they attract is really impressive. So you can see we've got more oh, corals yeah. over here, more frags, more outgrowth of different varieties. You can see also we use some of our urchins and different fish to just keep that natural environment going. So, so once they recover from here, where do they go? Into the ocean? Or? So not into the ocean yet. These are actually, a lot of these are like holding tanks. So we have a lot of stock of coral right now. Right. So a lot of this is just we've harvested these. 
but we're not, let's say, experimenting with them yet or using them yet to create modules. Okay. This right here, what you're looking at, this is actually coral propagation. So each one of these corals that's in one of these little yeah. um, buckets here is actually spawning daily. So yes. daily, it's spitting out little eggs and sperm packets that are spilling over, over the here top and collecting into it. the collection cup. Wow. So we can actually combine these collection cups, mix the sperm and eggs, and get yeah. juvenile larvae that can settle and grow into adult coral. So this yeah. is something that's really unique. There's not many coral facilities in the entire world that have planula daily available wow. to go into the ocean. So essentially, let's say in like the perfect world, in the perfect setting, you would be able to take these juvenile or, uh, juvenile corals uh -huh. and just dump the little babies into the ocean and that would be that many more seeds of coral right, right. You know, spread around the ocean. Yeah. So that's a really cool project and this type of coral that they're using is one of the only corals that spawns that frequently. Oh, I see. Yeah, a lot of times you may have heard of coral spawning with, let's say, a um, moon cycle. Yeah. And that's definitely the truth. These ones just happen to spawn, you know, more frequently. So. Well, better with some kind of coral than no coral. Absolutely. You know? And this yeah. coral in, particularly, in, in particular, it's a pioneer species. So this is the coral that, let's say I sink a boat in the water. This is the coral that's gonna attach to that boat first, mm -hmm. start growing, and create the environment that fish are attracted to, that oh, sea slugs are attack, attracted to. Yeah. So this is the essential, let's say, first step for uh, oceanic aquatic environment or coral reef. Wow. You know? So that's why this coral is really good at putting out lots of babies, and it grows really fast, but it also isn't a coral that grows forever. It's a coral that could get the size of a basketball and then it'll die. Oh, I see. So some corals will just keep growing and expanding right, for, for years hundreds and of years. years. This one doesn't. This, this one, one reaches no. a point this, and that's yep, it. It comes in quick, grows oh. big, makes the environment perfect for everybody, and then it's out. So it'll oh, still okay. be around because um, it's a common coral, but yeah, it serves kind of a different purpose. Wow, look at that. So Beautiful. yeah, this is honestly just like a holding tank. So these corals have been in here for years. So a lot of these are just growing up. These are some old experiments. Um, so this tank we use to keep some of our fish in that we use. Um, and also it has kind yeah, of a rotating actually, gallery. that's pretty cool. It? You'll see there's a concrete version of this inside the frag room over there. Oh, so I see. What we do is we create modules that the yeah. coral gets outplanted on. These are the uh, molds for the concrete. Right, modules. right. That's what so I those, thought. Yeah, the pyramids are what get outplanted onto the reef and glued down to the reef. However, the issue with that is that, although it may be a large surface area with lots of coral, it's not the best space for fish habitat. If you're a fish, where are you gonna hide in that pyramid? Yeah. Where are you yeah. going to you know, get shelter or a home? So that's why looking at diverse structures that create more three-dimensional shape and the yeah, potential like for other like directions of growth. Yeah. yeah. That's where this design's coming in. So essentially something like this could offer more growth outwards, but also they're looking at even putting mirrors around the corals to potentially reflect the light in different directions. Mm. Cause corals grow using light as well. Oh, I so see. if the light's focused over here, the coral may reach this way. And then if it's focused over here, it'll reach this oh, way. Versus the light just being coming on from top, the top where it's just growing like that. Right. It's Sean, guys. He's got other ideas. He wants to go out, I want to go in. <laughs> Big one, guys. Oh. First cast, too, isn't it? So, what you'll see in here is these are the pyramids that are going to be outplanted. So, we fragment the coral. Okay. And the coral, this is like the five star spot. Wow. So the corals are being grown out that will eventually cover this entire pyramid right. and then be outplanted onto the reef. So each one of these tanks here is built to store so many of these modules. 
This tank here is actually housing rare coral, so we actually have a library of almost every coral in Hawaii. Mm. That way, let's say a disease strikes any species in particular, we're able to have that species in our system here, work on propagating it to get it out planted as soon as possible. Oh, beautiful. So yeah, it's part of the system in the middle of the room. Oh yeah, the fungia, the mushroom corals. Those are you know, I saw about 20 of them in this hole. Yep. So what they'll do is when they, they'll sit inside holes, these are yeah. one of the only corals that don't need to attach to a oh, substrate, okay. so they right. can actually kind of move around. Oh, okay. But when they're stuck in a hole... So they're actually a coral. They're actually a coral. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'll show you some uh, skeletons of them outside. Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I caught oh, yeah. them live, and I, I always put them back, but, you know, I was just wondering, yeah. if this is this like a sea urchin or... <laughs> I it's, never knew what it was. It's a coral, so that's oh. a, the mushroom coral. And then what? what is the thing sticking out? Is that just a... Uh, so those are parts a, of its tissue. tissue. So yeah, they're not necessarily tentacles. They're not using those to grab Grab fruit? Oh, okay. Yeah, they do have tentacles, but they're going to be inside of those little grooves, and they kind of work like a train moving towards the mouth in the center. Oh, wow. Yeah. So Amazing. pretty cool. This is a coral that has one big mouth versus corals like this, which have hundreds of mouths. Each oh, of those okay. little circles is a mouth. Oh wow. Yeah. And then over here in the middle of the room, this is our uh, frag table. So this, these are the saws that they use to uh -huh. cut the coral into pieces, as you can see. And then those pieces will get glued onto the pyramid. The pyramid goes into the tanks. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, and there's that right behind you. Three oh, that one there too, yeah. Shape that we saw outside. So this, you're just testing this right now to see how it works out? Is that a new thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. It. We're just kind of prototyping it. We're, we're looking also at... Um, so with the one light, there's not a lot of light that's getting to the underside or getting really to the sides um, of this module. So oh, so you're testing there, the mirror mirror and no mirror yeah, to see yeah, which one that, grows that faster. Sick dog collar, oh, interesting. Um, to reflect some of that light <laughs> the in, in dog different collar. areas. <laughs> um, and, and in the amount of time that it's been in here, we've noticed significantly more growth. Uh, wow. With that. How long have you been in there? I, I don't know exactly, but it's uh, less than two months. Oh. So, Cool. That is pretty cool. That's a great idea. And then over here in this room, I'll just open the door so cool. you can break in. Okay. Nice. So this is one of our newer frag rooms. So wow. same thing, um, frag room two, more modules, more corals, and we'll see where these corals go after this room. Mm. Right, we'll leave this place. What, what is the plan for all the corals after? Like after they mature here? Oh, so after they mature here, we yeah. have tanks outside right. where they get adapted to, let's say, natural ocean conditions. Because this is the five-star oh, spot. This okay. is all perfect water, <laughs> perfect lighting, right. perfect everything. Temperature's perfect, everything. Right. Oh, so we okay. take them outside, they adapt to the natural environment, then they get outplanted. So this is what happens when they all merge together, the little yes. pieces? There you go, yeah, oh, exactly. Yeah, that's that great. is actually 100% covered. It is. All right. And we've got some more uh, out in one of our activated things that are also up here in the Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's good yeah. to know. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, appreciate thank you, Taylor. Yeah, appreciate it. it. The big tanks. The big tanks. Wow. So inside of these tanks, underneath the water here, there's actually like little tables. Uh -huh. And on these tables are the different modules. So depending on the different size of the modules, depends just kind of where we have them in here. So, so the water comes from that right there? This water is straight harbor water. Oh, okay. So yeah, this so gets is- gets used to that. Exactly. This a is like bit of, uh, more bacteria, more yeah. viruses, more junk in the water. Right. And then also you see the big uh, tanks on either side. Yeah. Here. So these tubs um, are essentially tubs that will fill up with water and then drain all at once, creating a large surge. Oh. And that's going to simulate wave action. Or tide and... Exactly. Okay. And so as that simulates that extra water movement, that's what makes the coral skeleton stronger. Ah. So if we took them straight from that room and put them in the ocean, they might not just get sick. They might be able to survive, let's say, all the bacteria and viruses. Right. But it would just take a small wave and... Crack gone. Them because they've got such a weak skeleton because right. they're in a pristine environment with no current. And I see you got fish in there, so yep. they got to deal with that kind of exactly. Now the, the fish we have in here, environment. Yep, the fish we have in here are just to like keep them clean, so they're gonna be algae eating fish. That okay, are just no like, woohoos or nothing. No, in the coral. no. <laughs> <laughs> that would be some good <laughs> training. You know, we got some baby woohoos. What's cool is when we use. Yeah. 
when we use the um, natural seawater, yeah. we do get recruitment of little things every once in a while. Okay. We've had mantis shrimp or we've actually oh, yeah. had boo -boo recruit into our tanks in oh, here. So wow. must have come in as a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. baby. And next thing we know, it's like, is that an Uhu swimming around <laughs> in the coral <laughs> no, tank? No yeah. kidding. Sure enough. That's great. Oh, and here we go. We got a uh, staff member. Oh, how you doing? doing? Doing maybe one of the best jobs. Oh, wow. Uh, cleaning. cleaning. Yes. Broken <laughs> coral right there. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, you can also see, too, that when we're using this uh, natural, let's say, harbor water, the amount of algae growth, oh, yeah. the amount of extra things growing is way more. So right wow. now, because it's super warm, we're mixing. As you can see, there's two inputs of water. Yeah. So one of those is coming filtered harbor water. The uh -huh. other is coming from the saltwater well on property. Oh, okay. And, and that's that, filtered and good water. Yeah. So, well, it's the well, it's the saltwater well water that comes up with all the nutrients and diatoms. Uh, so yeah. when we do that in the summer when it's hot, it means that all of this stuff goes like crazy. So yeah, no kidding. Get in here and do the fun stuff. Vacuuming. Yeah. <laughs> so are you cleaning those ones too? Um, yeah, so I uh, cleaned that guy yesterday and then oh. the one on the wow. far. Oh, that's why it's so oh, clean yeah, on no this side. These ones look so nice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can see the size, especially right here. These yeah. are our modules that are, let's say, I think these are uh, 12 inches by 12 inches. Okay. The largest modules that we have now are three feet by three feet. Oh, wow. Okay. So this space, of course, gives us the room to put something like yeah, that. Yeah, no kidding. Here. That's so great. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's it's in the right direction, you know? Absolutely. Everyone complains about everything not working, but mm -hmm. when you're taking those baby steps, yeah. it's so important. Habitat restoration is, yeah. you know, one of the best things that we can do right now. With so many, let's say, negative impacts on our nearshore environment that are killing our corals, that are killing our fish off, we can do a lot to stop those, but it's also important for us to have, let's say, a replacement plan, to yeah. have that restoration plan in action. So once we clean all the invasive algae out of this site, once we stop all the pollution, do we have the coral to put back in the area or do we miss our chance because the natural stocks are down that low? Yeah. So this is what's going to hopefully save us from that. And then this also is our insurance plan to, let's say, a boat comes into our harbors and gets blown in a storm up against mm. a reef. Mm -hmm. That boat may have damaged, let's say, 200 yards worth of coral how do they let's say how does that company or how does that boat become responsible for that how well we the navy did that the other like a couple years ago right exactly yeah. and that's the funding that goes into this type of project oh. so when the state says hey you've damaged so much amount of coral this is you know what we valued it at yeah when that money let's say comes back to the government yeah how does the government decide all right what are the projects that restore that resource that was lost mm. so this is one of the only ways that the let's say aquatic resources division has to replace that habitat because if a boat pays 200 million dollars for destroying a reef and that money can just go into forest restoration yeah what well, yeah you know, oh, that, it's terrible. you know so we need to have these projects yeah. at the state level so yeah. that that funding can get right into here right into yeah. there because otherwise you know we're going to hope that the federal level cover covers us but yeah we need to have our own insurance plans. that's right so, that's good to know yeah and this is one of our, you know, coolest projects because it's one of the very few, like, feasible products mm -hmm. that people can say, hey, this is what my state's doing to benefit our ecosystem, you know. <sighs> Come on. Woo. Strong guy. He's really trying to take it off the hook big guy guys big one big omilu oh good hook good hook come on come on I am Jason Bellinger and I am the 
education specialist on Oahu for the Division of Aquatic Resources. So my job basically is I run all of our education programs in schools out in the community, but I also am our representative at any public events as well. Right, that's where we actually met. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We got to meet at a fishing event, the fishing sale at the NEX. NEX, I right? That was yeah. great. Which is an awesome opportunity, you know, for us the opportunity to talk with fishermen at a site like mm-hmm. in a fishing shop, and especially on base. We got a lot of our retired military that right. came by that day. That's right. Mm-hmm. Lots of good stories to share and then for us it's just you know showing up that we support or showing that we support the community to just giving out free stuff at those right. events um, is a big part of what I do good mm-hmm. great so it, 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 basically educating the public yeah about the ocean and yep ocean about everything activity. we do like DAR's mission in general is to preserve manage and restore the various aquatic resources here in Hawaii mm-hmm. and the various aquatic ecosystems so my job is really broad based off of that mission statement so every aquatic ecosystem right. is DAR's responsibility be that freshwater brackish water or ah, water. interesting so it's just not the ocean itself it's mm-hmm. everything exactly everything uh. so that makes you know the job really big however when we talk about our user groups right there is of course a large focus on fishermen here in Hawaii and especially our coastal based fishermen. It's interesting is some people say, um, you know, I went bass fishing in Hawaii and they look at, you know, they're like, what? Bass <laughs> fishing? And but they don't realize there are some places that you can actually go and bass fishing. Absolutely. And that's one of my favorite things to do out here. I am a freshwater fisherman oh, more than a saltwater fisherman. Wow. So I personally live near the mountains and it's a lot easier for me to walk out my door and go into the forest and find smallmouth bass in the jungle right. versus making a 30 minute drive to the coast to go whipping for papio. So on that note, how did the bass get to the islands? That's a great question. So the bass were brought here actually as part of a program to help protect our shorelines. So it's crazy to think that something that's known as an invasive species that can be harmful to our streams was brought here for any reason. So what happened is in an effort to remove pressure from our shoreline, and a good way to think of this is think about every fisherman in Hawaii, when they go fishing, they're going to go fishing on the coast in the ocean. Correct. So that means X number of hooks in the water every single day fishing for the fish that are naturally occurring in the ocean. Correct. So if we bring fish here to Hawaii that are from a hatchery, so we're hatching them without using natural resources, Mm -hmm. and then those fish that are brought here, they were originally released into closed systems. Mm -hmm. So they were released into reservoirs and Mm -hmm. lakes that Mm -hmm. have no outlets to any other streams or any other bodies of water. So the idea is that with these contained populations, the pressure on our natural resources can be lessened by, hey, if you just want to go fishing for fun, why fish on the shoreline for fish that are naturally occurring that could die, let's say, if you're not using a barbless hook and you release them? Right. If you do that with our freshwater stocks, you're not depleting our natural resources. So it was a way in, let's say, uh, old school natural resource management methods Mm. that they decided to, hey, we'll remove pressure by giving people another place to fish. Now, I have a question for you. So if people are interested in bass fishing, do they need to get a, a permit? Oh, absolutely. So okay. there is here in Hawaii a freshwater fishing permit. So but if you're fishing in the ocean, no nothing. No need at all. If you're fishing off a boat on the ocean, no need. And yep. if you do go freshwater fishing, if you do go freshwater fishing, you need a recreational permit. And where do we get that? And you can actually get that on our website online at the Division of Aquatic Resources okay. website. And is there any cost to that? Yeah, it's a five dollar fee, so it's very for cheap one year. for one year. Oh. And then with that, there is also a little box you can check to get a free pass or a free. Um, access pass to Lake Wilson, which is one of our stocked freshwater fishing areas. That's awesome to know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for the cheap fee of $5, you can fish in all of our freshwater areas for a year. So whether you're at Lake Wilson or you're up at Nu'uanu hiking on the trails looking for smallmouth bass in the streams there, mm-hmm. as long as you have that permit, you're a legal fisher. Now, what, what type of fish are in the freshwater? There's a lot of tilapia that mm-hmm. who knows where they came from, but there's a lot of those. Yep. Uh, we have a big problem in Kauai. We saw that in the news. <laughs> Absolutely. But here on Oahu, uh, what other fishes can we catch? So in our stocked fishing areas, mm-hmm. we're going to have largemouth bass, 
smallmouth bass and peacock bass or two canaries. oh nice so yeah three really good game fish all once again brought here for the purpose of sports fishing that's great so those are great fish and you can catch those at our regulated areas which are lake wilson and mm -hmm. then you can also catch those at um what is it uh where's that military base up there oh by schofield yeah by one? schofield yeah so the lake right it's connected to lake wilson essentially but okay. part of the wahiwa reservoir oh there system. you go yep okay. so that wahiwa reservoir system lake wilson itself those are sites you can go to for kind of the premier freshwater fishing okay outside of that you're gonna find mostly just smallmouth bass okay. and the reason is is because going back to our story before is mm -hmm. that people said hey i really like fishing for these smallmouth bass It'd be really great if I could catch these in my backyard instead of at this lake that I go to every day. Oh, interesting. So what happened is people actually took some of these fish and released them into streams. And now that's why we see their populations as oh, invasive in the streams. Interesting. So they are brought here, of course, like many things with the best of intentions. But yeah. once they were released elsewhere, that's when they become a problem. But a great way for us to approach that problem, encourage fishing for them. They were brought here to be fished for. The right. more people that are out there fishing for these species, yeah. removing them from those sites, that's working double time because it's helping remove those, let's say, inundated streams from that invasive species. Now, I do see other fish in there, like the tilapias, but the, mm -hmm. there's another one that looks like a... The, one of those aquarium fish that stick to the window. Oh, great. Yeah, so that's a Picosimus or, okay. uh, you know, our sucker mouth catfish. Sucker mouth. Yeah. There you go. So those have been one of our worst invasions in our stream systems. Ah. So when it comes to a healthy stream here in Hawaii, yes. a big part of that is the stream connects to the ocean. So that's one big thing we need. Right. But another big thing we need is the animals in the stream hopefully are all native and the number one invasive is that sucker mouth catfish and the way it got into our uh stream systems is exactly what you could guess where do you see them the most often at the aquarium store right so, um, so if you do catch one mm -hmm. what, what do you uh want us to do if you catch one of those absolutely get rid of it dispose of it properly um you know if you aren't comfortable with killing it on site you can put it on ice and you can actually bury it and compost it oh, so we actually have some people who say i'm not comfortable with killing this fish because it's not you know it's still alive um you can go ahead and compost it and reuse it use it in your garden i would just recommend don't put it anywhere that you walk because the spines can be a little oh, right. uh, tough yes and they don't break down as quick so let's say you put it in a low e you might find a fish bone in your foot okay so <laughs> you know a little bit Later. go deep then. yep go Maybe. deep for right. sure but it's a great way to get some free compost too if you pull those out of the stream oh interesting mm -hmm. okay is there any other species that you want us to get rid of in the stream um you know in the streams if you catch the smallmouth bass i would say you know following make sure you still follow our legal size restrictions and mm -hmm. everything but if it's a legal size take it out of the stream you can compost it as well that's going to be that much less pressure on the stream and also the way that the bass have been recruiting in our streams we're not gonna let's say ruin your fish opportunity by taking a few out when you catch them okay so we want to make sure you know because people do like to fish for smallmouth bass but we also need to make sure we maintain the health of our streams okay so the balance in that is you know we'll make sure we go fishing but make sure we practice you know the rules that are in play you know? but the, the fresh water is not that big here in Hawaii not, not at really, all because people really don't associate fishing with fresh water absolutely <laughs> and then the food fish you know a lot of the here in hawaii one of the main reasons people fish is for food for, for food and sashimi exactly yeah. and who wouldn't want to fish you tacos. know <laughs> so when that's on the table you know literally on the table right why go fishing for smallmouth bass now smallmouth bass not to say that it doesn't taste good but for the average person in Hawaii, when fresh sashimi or smallmouth bass is on the table, they know which one they're going to choose. Right. That's true. <laughs> that's so interesting. that's one of the things is that, you know, um, in the past, we've actually released recipes um, for smallmouth bass, for largemouth bass. Uh -huh. And then, oh, on top of all this, I'm forgetting one of the one of the biggest things. Now, part of this whole program of stocking fish and uh, supporting freshwater fisheries expands uh -huh. beyond what we've talked about. We also have trout here in Hawaii. No okay. So for those of you trout fishermen out wow. there, there's opportunities to catch Hawaiian trout. Hawaiian trout. Is Absolutely. that a native of Hawaii? So they're just trout, that rainbow trout that are here in Hawaii. Oh, okay. So literally just physically in Hawaii, you can okay. catch a rainbow trout in Hawaii. So what happened is as part of the stocking program, we of course brought in these uh, catfish, 
um, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, and these are like normal catfish, channel catfish okay. that were originally brought here. There's not many of them around because the state people do eat catfish. People do eat catfish. Yeah. It just takes a little more work for those populations to, to sustain themselves. Right. So once we stopped, let's say feeding the fish. You just had to hope that the catfish hung on. So they're here and there right. in different spots, but because we're not actively, let's say, uh, building those populations, they're more rare species to find freshwater. There, there is another place there on the east side, you know, the Ho'omalahia. Ho Ho yeah, there you go. So Ho'omalahia is a great place to go fishing. Ho'omalahia is open on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock for right. public fishing. Great place for kids. The one restriction they have there is that you can only use bamboo poles or an extension hand pole. So you can use your 12 foot, oh, okay. you know, uh, crappie rod or, you know, your... Uh, but no reel. No reel. Just a, a line that's hooked on there. And that's their technical rule. Now, if you only have a rod and reel, it's okay to bring it. They just don't want you casting a lot because there's a lot of people around. Oh, there. I so see. It's a safety issue. Safety issue. Yeah, so that's why they and have those what, what recommendations. Catch there? So there they have smallmouth bass. Right. They have um Any tilapia. Tilapia. No trout no there. No trout. Okay. But they also have peacock bass there. Oh, okay. And the cool thing about peacock bass is we introduced those to our regulated fishing areas, Lake Wilson, New Juan and Reservoir. They were not introduced to Ho'omalahia. Oh. So somebody at some point in time released it. took some from one of those two sites, released it in that lake, and uh, now they are all over that lake. Okay. So that's so they, you mean they breed fast? They and, breed fast, and wow. what they've done actually is because that's a larger predator than yeah. the smallmouth bass. They've actually wiped out the smallmouth bass population in that lake. Oh. So you used to be able to catch a lot of smallmouth bass yeah. in Ho'omalahia. Now not so much, mostly tilapia. And then if you're using the right bait, you can catch those peacock bass. Because the tilapia is not that much fun. It's it really is no, not. You just they... throw a line in there with no nothing on, and still bite it. Exactly. But it's if you <laughs> with, with the peacock bass, though, at least it's a little bit of a challenge. Exactly. It's okay. a little bit of a challenge. It's a little more fun. And I've actually been able to work with Ho'omalahia. That's okay. a city and county park, and we're the state government. So right. two separate entities, so we got to work together. I can't right. just say what they you do. You just can't go right in there. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I've been able to work with them, and through my education program, I can actually run lessons or programs at the lake oh, nice. where we use rods okay. and reels. Right. We cast. We use live bait, lures, or artificial bait, whatever uh -huh. bait we want to use, and we catch whatever we can catch out of the lake. So they've let me come in there as the scientific entity and education entity to use their site as, hey, let's learn about what happens when you introduce an invasive species to a lake. Wow. Let's look at the dynamics of how this lake has changed over time. And also, let's give people the opportunity that they want to fish here. You know, safety is, of course, a strong concern. Yeah, but it should be the level priority, how, yeah. Right, but how awesome is it knowing that you or anybody in the community could request through us a uh, event there that does use you know casting and does catch some of those other fish perfect so uh, we'll put we'll list everything below yeah of course. Below your numbers and stuff yeah thank you there's something that you that you know someone the public can call you on mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, they definitely. can call me we're always here for fishing education resources and opportunities you know um it's something that it uh, surprisingly takes a little more work than you think here in Hawaii to find those really positive opportunities for our up and coming anglers as okay. well as people who want to just learn how to be a Hawaiian angler. Right. But at the end of the day, our goal is we want people to be out there fishing. And yeah, and, and that's the whole the, the point of this channel too is to inspire mm -hmm. you know the the kids and everybody to because I was inspired, you know, I started off five, seven, six years ago fishing. Mm -hmm. I never really fished before that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I had the I guess the know-how of what I know today, yep. I would have started a long time ago. And, and that's it exactly. You know, we learn our lessons the hard way. And if you can find the right people that want to share those lessons right. so they can give everybody else that jump start. You know, my biggest mantra throughout my job as an education specialist is how do I set people up for success? Some of the biggest issues we have within our fishing community, within our fisheries management, come from, let's say, miscommunications or let's say misunderstandings of positive practices. So the idea would be, you know, how many people out there want to be a rule breaker? How many people out there are consciously destroying the environment through mm -hmm. their fishing practices or through their collection practices? 
Not many. Everybody, I think, wants to do the best thing possible, but have we given them the tools to do the best thing? Right. You know, have we set immigrants coming to Hawaii up with the right know-how to know how to fish on our reefs? Because I've been to other countries in the Western Pacific. I've seen where common practice is to, you know, burn your trash on the side of the road versus put it in a trash can. Right. And that little adjustment, you know, may not seem like a big deal, but that's something that if I spent my whole life not throwing things away, why would I start practicing that today? You know, right. I may be somewhere well, else. On that note, um, I'm going to show right now, you're probably going to see it's going to be on the screen mm -hmm. with the sign that is, you got these big, beautiful signs with, uh, you know, recreation, this is area mm -hmm. for, for this, this is for fishing, mm -hmm. this is for boating. Now, when someone sprays over that and you can't see anything, or you have trash cans that are overflowing going into the ocean, um, what should the public do? So, that is a huge issue we have here. You know, as an agency for the state, we have, of course, limited resources to not only respond to every issue, but to be aware of these issues. So, right. with that in mind, We've tried to bridge that gap by creating more methods for the community and for the resource users mm -hmm. to get in touch with us, to let us know, hey, this sign's got graffiti all over it. It's not going to be useful for anybody here at the site because our job as a civil service agency is to provide the public with these services and with these tools. Right. So we, of course, are here to do our job. And so with that in mind, if you do see a sign with graffiti on it, if you do see trash overflowing at a harbor, that's a division of boating issue and division of boating has on their website right in their contacts a form that you can fill out to report any marine debris if you're out at sea or if you're just at one of their harbors they have a hotline you can call get right in touch with their front office and you better believe they're gonna call their harbor master and get that person on whatever that issue is because so in other words what you're saying is it, it's not that one person but it's a whole community of fishermen themselves whether you're doing it for fun or you mm -hmm. do it for a living uh, if you're on the beach it takes all of us to make it right absolutely as the state agency we're just one of the pieces of the puzzle in this big community of and that has nothing to do with your your department too right that the sign yeah the sign we, yeah exactly so that was something you know i would be per presented with that frequently and that's so we would we yell at you but you're like hey wait a minute that's <laughs> hey, not my division yeah divisional it, aquatic resources there. we we literally only deal with living things in the water right so if the water is dirty i may be able to say oh yeah it's coming from over here but that might be a different agency's responsibility right so that's where interagency communication is important in terms and i think it's important that the public knows that too because we all think <laughs> just, just one bunch right yeah exactly. you guys aren't doing a job <laughs> and it's really there's a whole division Exactly, exactly. There's, there's so many different departments that function to serve the public and right. it's unfortunate that it's not as clear as it should be for the public to get in contact with all of us. So that's why I like to serve as that go-between. If I can't do it, I'm going to find the person who can so that we can make sure this gets done because I want to set you up for the next time you see a sign at this site that doesn't have you know the type of writing it needs or it's been damaged. Or, or even like phone numbers, emergency see phone numbers uh, mm -hmm. if the, the garbage is filled there's maybe a number there for that but if exactly. it's sprayed over and you can't read it exactly right. so you know that's something that you know we make sure that we have the venues for you to access us to take care of that that right. is our job and then as a community of fishermen you know there's only so many people inevitably even in the best case scenario working as part of the government right which will always be outweighed by the constituents by the resource users. and that's why it's important to have a community the fishing industry the there fishing you go fishermen exactly the guys who go on the boat just to go fishing mm -hmm. on weekends we're all involved in that and mm -hmm. we have to as humans work together to make things better for the next generation because it's really not about us yep. it's really about the children that they can have the mm -hmm. same fishing experience that we are having am i right about that absolutely okay. it's it's all of our responsibility you know it's a 
uh, each of us plays a little piece of this puzzle. I may have the ability to do more official things than you do, right. but as somebody who's out there way more often than I am, yeah. you're going to see changes before I see them. So you're going to be the one who can tell me what's going on before I ever notice. You right. can say, hey, there's people spraying graffiti on this sign right now versus me figuring it out five months later when I show up at that site for whatever I may be there for. And that, yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, and you know, so overall- There's so much to cover for you on your, on your <laughs> end. Yeah. yeah. From, from salt water to the fresh exactly. water to the rivers. So within you know my end of things, I only focus on the education and let's say- the, And the living things. The living things yeah. for DAR. But with that in mind, it's like my best hope for kids, for fishermen, for people who don't fish, is just for us all to understand the piece we play mm. in resource management. You know, as a fisherman, I always try to get kids to say, hey, think about this reef or the place you go fishing like a farm. Are you going to harvest all your crops at once? No, you wait for things to be ready, and when they're ready, you harvest them. Maybe you harvest a little now, you harvest a little later. But think of it as something that you're caring for, like you care for your garden. And a lot of people understand that more than they understand caring for the ocean. Yeah, so like if you need one fish to mm -hmm. eat, why get ten? Exactly. Well, you want to give it to your friends to promote that you're a good fisherman? It makes no sense. There you go. And that's the thing that I, as part of my fishing lessons, one of the biggest things I'll tell the students is, we are in a culture of the best fisherman is the fisherman who catches the biggest fish or the fisherman who catches the most fish. And we've all seen the picture of the giant fish hanging on the ground right. or let's say the tarp behind me with 60 to 80 fish off the reef fresh. Yep. And I say, oh, look, I just caught a whole bunch of fish. The best fisherman's the guy who's got two fish, average size, just what he needs yep. because he's going to be fishing forever. That big fish may be one day for your entire life. Yep. That 60, 80 fish behind you, that's not sustainable. And nobody who's catching that amount of fish thinks that's sustainable. That's right. So we need to, as a community, say, hey. Change that whole mindset. Yeah. It's just, you know, you could take pictures. Mm -hmm. It's all catch and release. Yep. Take a picture and throw it back. There we go. Yeah. We can get our trophies and our satisfaction other ways. That's right. why things like barbless hooks are so important because we really need to just change that kind of mindset about the sport. Because once yep. again, nobody's out here to be a bad guy. But once the culture says, hey, you're a great fisherman because your practices are so positive that you're making the fish last for generations. Yeah, that's 100% the best fisherman every day. You know, nobody can argue about that. So, that's, you know, that's, that's what we want to make sure everybody turns into because we all have the capability to do that. Even if you've never cast a rod and reel before, you can be the best fisherman possible. Just practice the right way. There you go. Right? That's good. <laughs> Jason, what's what makes your job so satisfying? Why are you so energetic, happy? <laughs> <laughs> what makes you tick every day in your job? I think that wanting to be a marine biologist, my goal was to do something that made a difference. I always loved fishing. Fishing was something that got me into marine science. And as I went through school, I realized that a lot of the directions that I had become accustomed with thinking of in terms of marine science, like lab coat, head down in a microscope, <laughs> that wasn't necessarily what I wanted to do and it didn't make the difference I wanted to make. Right. So I ended up, you know, working in this job where I get to talk to the public every day. How, how did you start off though? What was your oh, okay. major in college? So yeah, then... I, I studied marine biology in college. Okay. And at that point, I still wanted to be a captain of a fishing vessel, a commercial So obviously at vessel. that time, you were very in, involved in the ocean ocean and, mm -hmm. and where were you raised oh okay yeah so i was born in california okay and i started fishing there for trout and then i actually moved when i was in first grade to missouri wow and the dead center of missouri warrensburg missouri and i lived right in between two lakes so every single day after school i would go fishing i would be chest deep in the stream <laughs> fishing with snakes swimming past me that's where i really cut my teeth you know in terms of wow. freshwater fishing and then I moved to Maryland, and that's where I went to middle school and high school. Uh -huh. And I, of course, continued to fish there. And then I also worked at the aquarium in Baltimore. 
So I kept my kind of fish lifestyle going. I worked at a marina because I always wanted to work around boats. So I learned how to trailer boats and drive boats. And then of course I want to study marine biology. And I thought if I study marine biology in Maryland, I'll get stuck studying blue crabs forever. Oh. <laughs> so long story short, I came to Hawaii, studied marine biology, ended up working for NOAA in the fisheries as a fisheries observer. So I spent two years working on the long line fishing boats mm. here in Hawaii, taking data for the government. Um, I spent a little over a year. I have a 376 days out at sea working that job. Um, spent living on board those long line vessels, getting to see what the front lines are like in terms of commercial fishing here in Hawaii. And then from there, being able to see the difference between what I learned in school to mm -hmm. what the reality of fishing was like, I knew that I wanted to be in a place where I can work for both sides. I want to preserve the ocean, but I understand that fishing is a resource that we rely on. Right. And it's one that can be done sustainably. Right. So one of the biggest lessons I learned, especially when it came to the long line fishing, is when you hear there's 300 boats that can put out a 50 mile long line with 3,000 hooks on it every single night. That sounds like an overfishing nightmare, right? Right. 3,000 hooks, 50 miles of line. Right. Some nights those guys are lucky to catch five fish. That's 3,000 hooks for five fish that are marketable. Wow. So it shows that the effort out is what it takes just to get you know close to even so we're not necessarily overfishing we're just requiring that much effort to get what the demand is to get what you know the business to get to the point where the business is efficient right so with that in mind you see wow these aren't money making machines that are destroying the environment these are people who are surviving off of a lifestyle that isn't quite as sustainable as it used to be right you know and it's changing What's the biggest change that you see in the fishing industry? You know, the biggest change I see is a lot of times we talk about the way things used to be and the way the size of fish used to be and the way the stocks The big used Lua to be. that we used to cast. Yeah, now exactly. It's half that size. And yeah. And I think the big change is kind of that, you know, as a community, we have a lot less people who have had those experiences. Mm -hmm. So I think that what's becoming normal for people is unfortunately the idea of, oh, there's not a lot of fish, so I don't go fishing anyway. Oh, it's not yeah. worth going fishing because we're not catching what they used to catch. And, you know, times have changed. The populations has here in Hawaii has right? increased. The way that we treat our oceans on a global scale is impacting what happens here in Hawaii. Well, population in general yeah. has increased from a billion to seven billion now. Exactly. So, of course, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you can see that in the territory. marine debris that shows up on shore, which is, yeah. you know, far from produced in the U United States. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, it just shows that, you know, that new normal that especially younger kids are getting accustomed to is kind of putting, let's say, a um, spin on our environment that people aren't as encouraged to fight for it. But that, that makes it more that much more important for you guys to really teach the younger kids how to catch and release and protect mm -hmm. the environment because... Yeah. This really is disappearing, but, you know, the old stories that we hear. Absolutely, and with those old stories, we're also losing the number of fishermen out there. The yeah. number of people actively fishing and the number of kids that are actively taking fishing into their adult life styles and their adult hobbies is lower than ever from what I've heard and with that in mind it's because of that kind of environment of oh fishing is so impactful fishing uh, you know we're already taken from a depleted resource but what we're here to do is you know we're here to make the rules and to create the atmosphere that we do have a sustainable resource that you can go fishing right that despite you know you may not be seeing as large a fish as your great-grandfather caught you can still have sustainable practices and not be a negative impact by practicing. But you know what's sport. funny though, with, with the YouTube channel and uh, Instagram and all that, mm -hmm. you still see people catching big fish. Of course. You know, yeah. so yeah. to me, when the people say, oh, the fishing's out, I'm thinking, well, have you seen that picture of that guy or have you seen that big octopus? And, that guy? And 
that that's the truth they're out there and let me tell you being on those long line boats if you ever thought that oh there's no more big fish out there they're out there for sure i've seen yeah. tuna that i could fit inside of and i'm six two you know right. <laughs> 200 and that's what people pounds. you know for even from my point of view is people see my videos and they go wow you, you know you're catching bigger fish but you know, it's like you can't wait for the fish to come to you. You got to go out and find them. Absolutely. So you got to find methods. How, like, if you look at the old Hawaiian pictures, they used mm -hmm. to have canoes. Yeah. They would go out on their canoes yep. and go fishing, compared to just sitting on the beach and then waiting for the fish to come to you. Absolutely. Yeah. You're very right. And that knowledge that was intrinsic in their community that was part of their lifestyle is right. what we're losing as well right that's why it's so important to learn from let's say your elders seek you know advice from people who've been fishing in these areas before you have because that you know ability to know hey at this time of year these fish are here and they like to hide around these types of rocks right that's going to help you catch that big fish that maybe has been eluding you the whole time that's correct but it takes a little bit more effort on your part to say hey i know enough about this fish to find the big one like that's you right. said that's it's right. not just like oh i bought the good bait at the store yeah it's gonna come i mean to i me. see these guys line up with their <laughs> you know like two thousand dollar reels and a thousand dollar poles and they got seven of them right on the beach and they're out there and i come back with you know a good size omilu mm -hmm. they're looking at me like where'd you get that you know how'd you find that and i'm <laughs> thinking you, you just you can't just sit on your ass and do nothing yep. you gotta go out there and find them exactly and that's that's the lesson in itself right there is you know that little bit of extra effort you know is not only gonna refine your skills as a fisherman and make you just a better fisher who's able to catch those big fish but you're gonna know that much more about the ocean the animals in it and you're gonna care that much more about what when things happen how right. things happen right. so when you see the brown water coming down after a storm you're gonna know oh no my favorite omilu spots that are right over here you know they are pretty shallow yeah Boom, you know <laughs> that's interesting because that's exactly how that's what i in my mind i think like that too all the yeah. time and that's that's just the development of you don't need to be a scientist to think about things the way that you or I do. You right. know, you just need to be a hobbyist. You know, you need to be somebody <laughs> who cares about what you're doing. Yeah. Do I walk through the forest and say, oh, these are just a bunch of trees with leaves on them, or can I name each tree and figure out, oh, this one's growing here because the light's like this, or this one's growing here because there's no light. Think about that in the ocean with fish and things. Add that little bit of layer to your knowledge base. Knowledge, and I think we'll knowledge take, is everything. Yep, we take and that's it. where you come in. <laughs> yep. Now, if anybody wants, any kids are watching this right now, and they want to be where you're at today, yep. what is your suggestion to them what's what, what are the routes that you you should they should take number one recommendation for any kid out there who's looking to get involved in marine science who's looking to take fishing into a career is experience 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 if you know what you like now you're already on your way to your career so when I was a little kid I loved fishing I loved being around the water so all I did was hey I want to work at jobs that are near the water or around the water whether that was an aquarium at a marina or even a surf shop so each little bit of experience you get is one piece of the puzzle on your way to where you want to be. As long as you stay focused with that in mind, you'll end up where you want to go. Just awesome. make sure you add those layers. That's right. <laughs> All right. But thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Of course. And we learned so much. And then we'll see you probably at some expos. And, yeah, uh, absolutely. What's the next one that you're going to have? So we're going to be at the National Hunting and Fishing Day coming oh. up in the second week of September. So that's going to be statewide keep an eye out at the National Hunting and Fishing Day website uh, it's a national website okay. for events in your local area okay. but we should have at least one event on each island um, most of the most of them are hunting events but we okay. should have some fishing events here on Oahu. And where are you gonna be at? I will be at the uh, is, it, is it Blaisdell? No it's actually at the shooting range Oh, at the, over there by Hanama Bay. Uh, yeah, over That's there like, by Hanama Bay. Okay. So we're going to be at the shooting range on Sunday. We'll be there with our fishing simulator so you can feel what it's like to catch a real fish off of oh, a wow. chair on the back of a boat. So it simulates catching marlin, uh, tarpon, smallmouth bass. Wow. <laughs> even. And I think we just got a new uh, version with ahi on it. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, awesome. it should be pretty fun. All right, guys. So look out for Jason. And thank you so much for your time. All right. Go Woo! guy is strong. 
Uh, 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 Not a big, huge one, but huge enough. Big enough. All right, let's go in. All right, guys. Uh, today I'm wearing my black pants because uh, it rubs against this stain here, and it just I have a huge rash on the bottom of my leg. So, but uh, it's actually perfect for these conditions. Anyway, guys, here we go. Moment of truth. It is a 20. Exactly a 20. Very happy. Second throw. Was not sure, but now I am. Hungry. 